Amen. Our text today is 2 Peter chapter 4. Timothy. And we're going to start reading with verse 6, but our text begins with verse 8 and goes to the end of the chapter. So let us stand for the reading of the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 22. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark, bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. But Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak, which I left to Troas, with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The war, war, Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greek Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus remained in Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick in Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you. Also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Let me ask you a question. What do you think is the significance of the title of my sermon today? The title of my sermon is the last God-breathed words of the last apostle. Remember, Paul, at this point, is a few days away from martyrdom, probably by being beheaded. He's in a dungeon in Rome. He's an old man. He's in his 60s. That's young today, but that was old back in the first century. In just a handful of years, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by Roman armies. Paul's going to be beheaded before that day comes. And uh, these last verses of 2 Timothy 4 that I've just read, especially 9 through 22, is one of the most significant events in the history of the world. My Claudia, Linus, Tychicus, what do these people have to do, these verses, with the most important, one of the most important events in the history of the world? Well, these are the last words of, God-breathed words of the last apostle. Paul says he's the last of the apostles. Paul died in the 60s. What does that mean? That means you are reading the last verses ever written, included in the Bible. With these verses, you have a complete God-breathed book. With these verses, you have the completion of the 66 books of the Bible. 
Now, why is that one of the most significant things in the history of the world? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that when the Bible is complete, when that revelatory process that gives us the Bible is complete with the 66 books of the Bible, all of the former ways of God revealing himself to man will come to an end. Visions, voices out of the sky, unknown tongues, all these things were the ways and means by which God got his word to man in piecemeal fashion. But then when the perfect thing came, when the completed thing came, when the 66 books of the Bible were completed, all these piecemeal ways by which God revealed himself came to an end. And from that moment on, from the last verses of 2 Timothy, the last book of the Bible to be written, by Paul, when these words were written, from that point to this, to the end of the world, God does not reveal himself to man anywhere else but in the 66 books of the Bible. Don't ask him for a sign, he's not going to give it to you. Don't ask him for a voice out of the sky, he's not going to give it to you. Don't ask him to whisper in your ear, he's not going to give it to you. Don't ask him for a miracle confirming your decision. He's not going to give it to you. God does not reveal himself in any other fashion since these verses except through the all-sufficient word of God. You remember what he said there in chapter 3? Look at verses 16 and 17 again. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture originated with God, the words and the thoughts. <clears throat> And all scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. You don't need anything outside the Bible for man to uh, equip you for every good work. You read the Bible, you hear it preached, but if that preacher doesn't preach the word of God to you... Don't waste your time with it. Uh, and you certainly don't need a prophet. Back when I ran for the United States Congress, a lot of my dear charismatic friends would come up to me and they would lay hands on me and they would prophesy that I was going to win. Of course, after I lost, they were nowhere to be found. <laughs> but they would prophesy that I was going to win and they would all say to me, some of them would say to me, uh, I've got a word from God for you. Do you want to hear it? And every time I would sweetly say, no, thank you. Because if you're telling me something from God that's not in the Bible, verse 17 is not true. But all I need to be thoroughly equipped and every good work is in the word of God. If a preacher doesn't preach the word of God, if he adds to it, if he takes away, uh, walk away from him. Don't get near him. When people come to you and say, well, God told me this and God told me that. No, he didn't. God hadn't told anybody anything since these verses were written outside the Bible. That's what, And even if Jesus doesn't come for millions of years, this Bible will still keep everybody thoroughly equipped. And even a million years from now, they will not need any prophets or any signs or anything else to be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. You say, well, how can a book written by men be that complete and that sufficient for the next million years? Well, I think more than a million because I think we're still going to be reading the Bible in heaven for billions of years. But bear in mind that God used men to write it, but the ultimate source, the ultimate author is God himself. There's no other book in the world about which that could be said. <laughs> and the 66 books of the Bible. So we're reading, we have just read, and we're gonna talk about the last God-breathed words of the last apostle. And the next time God speaks to you, you'll be dead. <laughs> and you'll be in his very presence. 
And then to use the scriptures, he'll, he will talk to you face to face. Now let's look at our text, because it is quite a text. You learn a great deal about God's dealings with man. You learn a great deal about Paul. You learn a great deal about the early church. Remember, Paul's giving his testimony, verses 6 and 7. He's aware that his departure is about to take place, that he's not going to be alive much longer. And so he testifies in verse 7, which we looked at last week, the good fight I have fought, the course I have finished, the faith I have kept. And now he tells us something about his faith in the future. He said, in the future, I don't exactly know the time, but I know it's dear at hand. There's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, also to all who have loved his appearing. So Paul's thinking about the future. He's thinking about death, but his thoughts are not focused on death. They're focused on the second coming. Have you ever seen in a lot of the hymn books of church, <coughs> most of the songs they sing are about dying? As if that's the great grand finale. As if uh, that, that is the end of the story. Death is not the end of the story. Resurrection is the end of the story. When Jesus Christ comes again and all those who are alive at the time are transformed and all those who have died will be raised from the dead and their bodies will be eternalized and those that did not believe in him will be sent to hell and those that are Christians will body and soul be with Christ throughout all eternity. So that's the focus. Paul knows his departure is about to come. But the thing that really gives him comfort it's the second coming of Christ. And though, even though if he dies, he's not going to miss out on it. There used to be a lady that I would visit named Gwen Nix. Gwen Nix stayed in Zimmy Farr's house most of her life. She was no relationship to the Farr's. She was paralyzed completely from her neck down. She could talk, she could see, and she stayed in that condition for 40, 50 years. And I would go see her and we have great fellowship. And this was back even when Zimmy was a little girl. And I would, we'd have great fellowship, Gwen Nix. She had a, a uh, board at the end of her bed on the wall with photographs of people she prayed for all the time. I took great pride in the fact that my photograph was there. But then the paralysis started creeping up eye to her face. She could only barely whisper. She couldn't move her eyes and obviously death was near. So I went to see her in a hospice and to hear her I had to put my ear right down to her mouth. And she said this in a low whisper, knowing she's going to be dead in a few days. I'm so excited. I'm going to get a new body. What was she thinking about? The second coming of Christ. That's what she was looking for. She knew that when she died, she'd be at home with the Lord, but the thing she was really looking forward to was the resurrection of her body so that body and soul she stands before God throughout all eternity. And Paul says, I'm looking forward to that day because that day, the, right, the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give me what's laid up for me in heaven, the crown of righteousness. When he says in the future there's laid up for me, that means it's secure, it can't be lost, can't be forgotten, it's safe and sound, there's not the slightest possibility that Paul is going to miss out on receiving this in the future. And he said what's laid up for me, safe and sound, that the righteous judge is going to give me on the day of his appearing is the crown of righteousness. Now notice, 
the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Now, what is this crown of righteousness? Roman Catholicism loves this verse hmm. because they misinterpreted to say that any blessings we receive from God in the afterlife must be earned and merited here. And so whatever blessings God rewards you with is rewarding the, your meritorious obedience and righteousness to him. Of course, we know that's a contradiction of the whole Bible. What is a crown of righteousness? Well, a crown is a metaphor. It doesn't mean he's going to put a crown on his head. It's just like it, he crowned me with righteousness. In other words, this crown of righteousness is something God is going to crown him with, and that is the perfect, perfect and eternal life we have in Christ, consummated and completed. So why is it called a crown of grace? Why is it a crown of righteousness? Why didn't he say the Lord, the gracious judge? Is Paul, hey, have too much confidence in himself? Of course not. He said he's the, lead, the worst sinner there ever was. He's, what he's saying is this crowning me with this consummate blessing is a righteous act on the part of God who is a righteous judge and who would never do anything unrighteous. Why is this crowning of Paul with perfection at the second coming of Christ uh, the righteousness of God doing it? What Paul is saying here is, I know I can't lose it. I know I'm going to be crowned and it's going to originate in righteousness. God's a righteous judge and he's going to be faithful to every word he's ever spoken. He's going to be faithful to every promise he's ever spoken. And if he promised me that he would give me eternal life by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that he never goes back on his word, knowing that he never acts contrary to his nature, he's going to be righteous in the fulfilling of that promise. Now, I like what Augustine said. And Augustine, you know, was one of the two or three greatest men in the history of the church since Bible times. He lived 1,500 years ago, North African. And he said this in so many words. He said, uh, A righteous judge is not going to reward you righteously unless he, as a loving father, previously gave you grace. In other words, God's going to bless our faithfulness to him. But our faithfulness is such that we don't deserve it. We, ne we never do anything perfectly. And yet when God adopted us, said Cowan, he also adopted all our good works. When God adopted you into his family, were you perfect? No. When you do good works for him because they're imperfect, does God reject them? No. Nope. God accepts all the good works you do for the same reason he accepted you, through Christ alone. And so Paul's not bragging. He's saying God has laid up for me secure a crowning event at the second coming that is a result of the righteousness of God in being faithful to his promise. He is a righteous judge. And he will award to me that crown on that day. And not only to me, but also to everybody who has loved his appearing. That's one of the great marks of true faith. You love the second appearing of Christ. There's only two physical appearing appearances of Christ in history. One had to do with his incarnation 2,000 years ago. And the other has reference to his second coming, his second physical coming, which is a great manifestation of his glory. When he appears and every eye shall see him, and he appears in all his majestic sovereignty. That's what the second coming is all about. 
Paul said, that's when God's going to reward me with this perfect crown. And not only me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Does the second coming ever play a part in your faith or in your motives or in the determining of what's going on in your attitude and in yourself? In other words, can it be said of you that you love his appearing? You love the thought of it. You love the anticipation of it. Whatever it's going to take place, we don't know. But you love the thought of it, and you love the idea of being awarded by a righteous judge after having received grace in this life. That you look forward to the day when Christ, who has been humiliated and mocked throughout the centuries of mankind, will no longer be humiliated, but will stand there as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Paul says, that's what really gives me comfort. Remember he said in Corinthians, he said to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. But then he said this interesting thing. He says, it's going to be so great to die, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, but I still will feel naked, he said in 2 Corinthians. Because I won't have my new body. And Paul's saying, in effect, I'm not simply going to be a spirit floating around in heaven you can poke your hand through throughout all eternity. At the resurrection, I'm going to be fully and completely and perfectly human again, body and soul. And as I've said so many times, I praise the Lord that we're not just going to be spirits. We're going to be body and soul perfected. Because I want to hug Jesus. And you got to have arms to hug him. I want to kiss his feet. And you got to have lips to kiss his feet. And so the resurrection and the second coming of Christ is the goal of salvation and, and even Paul's hope. And then verse 9 says a great deal about Paul and Timothy and his relationship. Make every effort to come to me soon. Now, Timothy's pastoring a little church plant in Ephesus in Turkey. Paul is to the far west in a dungeon in Rome. <laughs> so he knows he's not asking a trivial little request of Timothy. He knows it's going to take him a long time to get to Rome. So he says, make every effort. Try your dead level best, Timothy to come and see me soon. My departure is at hand. Now, why did Paul want to see Timothy? Well, you remember throughout these books, he's referred to Timothy as his beloved son. Not physically, but spiritually. He led him to Christ. He trained him. They had that close relationship. And Paul, there in the dungeon, wanted to see this man that he loved. He maybe had some things he wanted to teach him, some last minute advice. And so Timothy, I assume, made it to Rome. But he said, Timothy, I know it's a long way. I know you've got to go through um, Turkey and Greece and Europe and the Mediterranean all the way to the Italian Peninsula. You can't take a plane. You're going to be gone a long time. But he says, I, I, I need you. Why? Verse 10. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. This is the third time Paul talks about his former friend Demas. Demas was one of Paul's associates, maybe one of Paul's students, one of Paul's assistants in the advance of the gospel and all his missionary activities. He's mentioned in Colossians. He's mentioned in Philemon. But here's the saddest of all. 
Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Has deserted me, implying has deserted the cause, has deserted the mission, has deserted the faith, has deser deserted me as the Holy Spirit inspired voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loved what this world could offer more than he loved what Jesus could offer. And Brother Rome could offer you a great deal if you were willing to kiss the feet of the statue. He wanted material things. He wanted the pleasures and enticements, privileges, prestige, that this present evil world had to offer him. A Roman culture. More than he loved what Jesus could offer. How many people does that describe today? Start out good. Start out reading the Bible, coming to church. But then the world gets a stronger and stronger hold on them. And they become more and more seduced by the pleasures and the powers of this world so that sooner or later they walk away. Demas was not only a professed Christian, he was not only a member of the church, he was probably a preacher and was an assistant of Paul and heard Paul's preaching. Heard Paul's spirit-inspired preaching. And still, loved the world more than Christ. So Paul says he's deserted me. He's gone to Thessalonica. We don't know what happened to Demas in history. Now this second man mentioned here is interesting. Crescens has gone to Galatia. He's just given Timothy a report. Friends, he knew that we're with him in Rome. And he says, Demas has deserted me, but Crescens has gone to Galatia. Doesn't say anything negative about Crescens. Galatia was a certain part of Turkey uh, inhabited mostly by Celtic people. The book of Galatians was written to churches predominantly Celtic in Turkey. Now, here's the exciting thing too. There's a bunch of ancient Greek manuscripts of this verse. Crescens has gone to Galatia. About half of them say Crescens has gone to Galatia and the other half have has Crescens has gone to Gaul. You know where Gaul is? France. Paul had preached all the way to the coast of Spain. So it's perfectly reasonable to think that he wanted churches planted in France. In fact, outside Lyon, France, there's an ancient church that has a plaque in it that says the Christianity was brought to France by Crescens. Whichever. Paul wants the gospel spread all over the world. And then you have the last verse in verse 10. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. You know where Dalmatia is? It's a city in Croatia to this day. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Sort of a sad statement. Luke was his dear, dear buddy and friend and personal physician. Do you know, by the way, that Luke wrote most of the New Testament? If you ask the average person today who wrote the most of the New Testament, they'll say Paul. Not true. He wrote the most books in the New Testament. But Luke only wrote two books. But they were Luke and Acts. And they have more pages in those two books than in all the books of Paul put together. Luke was quite a scholar, historian, doctor, evangelist, and he was with Paul on several of his missionary journeys. And in the book of Acts, 
you can usually tell whether Luke is with Paul on this particular journey, not by Paul mentioning his name, but by Paul saying we. And so when Paul said we are at a certain place, he's talking about Luke. Luke traveled with him all over the world. Pick up Mark on your way from Turkey to Rome. Bring him with you, for he's useful to me for service. Now that's the Mark that wrote the gospel according to Mark. That's the Mark that used to tra uh, travel with Paul and Barnabas until one time in one of the previous missionary journeys, Mark up and left. I don't know whether he deserted him. I don't know whether he got homesick. I don't know what, but he, he was gone. And pa Paul told Barnabas, I don't want him going with us anymore. Too immature. Well, apparently Mark had matured through the years. And so now he says, when you come and see me, bring Mark. He's very useful to the ministry here. I need Mark. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Now I'm sure that Timothy was wondering, what's my little church going to do if I go to Rome and be gone all that time? It'll take weeks to get there, weeks to get back, and I'll spend weeks with him. So what's my little, how's my little church going to survive? Paul said, I'm sending Tychicus. You're going to have a preacher. Don't worry about him, Timothy. Verse 13, I love this verse. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. One time I was preaching at a little Bible college in Bristol, Tennessee. I was preaching at a cha chapel service, and I would use that school's library a lot because it had a lot of books given to it by retired preachers and there's some great great classic books in there and uh, I noticed that all the good books that uh, none of the good books that I was checking out was checked out by any of the students so at that chapel meeting I preached on this text when you come bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books especially the parchments and I laid into that bunch of students for letting the best library in Bristol, Tennessee go to waste because they would rather read pulp fiction and froth than the heavy and substantial works of God. Now, uh, when you bring the cloak, Calvin thinks that the word cloak in Greek means box or briefcase or suitcase in which these books and parchments would be, could very easily be. But why would a guy forget his cloak? Now remember what the cloak is. It's rough wool. It's like a big army blanket with a hole cut in the middle so you can put it over your head and stay warm in the winter. And Paul was in a dungeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he may give away what he really meant, what he really wanted, when he tells Timothy again, verse 21, make every effort to come before winter. I not only want to see you, Timothy, I need my rough wool poncho. Now, what were these books and parchments? Well, there's no other place in the Bible where the Bible is identified as books and parchments. That's not the way he refers to the Bible. It's not the way he referred to the Old Testament. That's not the way he referred to the writing of the other apostles. So I think these were, and I remember when he says books, you don't, don't think book. Weren't printing presses. They were rolls, parchments, hand copied, duplicated by hand. These were the books and parchments Paul was reading. Now think about that for a minute. Here's the Holy Spirit inspired apostle saying, I can't live without my books. I've got to have books to read. 
You and I are not Holy Spirit inspired. We need books even more than he needed books. Do we ever read? Do we read God owned books or books about history or whatever this was to continue to educate himself? These books weren't authoritatively, divinely inspired. Paul said, I need them, I want them. Now notice another thing about this request. When you come bring the cloak which I left to Troas with purpose and the books, especially the parchments. Paul is an old man. He is a frail old man. He has been plagued with various sicknesses, physical injuries all his life. Not in the best of health. Old man, elderly man, still reading books. Still reading parchments. Still learning. See, that's what a disciple is. The literal the meaning of the word disciple is learner. When you quit learning, you're no longer a disciple. And so you keep reading, you keep learning, you keep buying books, you keep reading books throughout your life. Because somebody like Paul, a Christian, has a hunger for information, for true information. He has a hunger to learn more about God, about life, about himself, about politics, about nations, about history. Is that you? There's this funny guy on Facebook. I think his name is Dice, but he's hilarious. And he's conservative, and he always interviews people to show how stupid Americans are. And he's usually on the beach somewhere in Florida. And he was interviewing these young adults, saying to them, what's the last book you read? These young adults were in their 20s, maybe 30s. They couldn't remember. Some said, well, uh, I, I don't know if I ever did. <laughs> you know, I never read a book until I got out of high school. Never read a book. I had a book called The 500 Leading Pieces of Literature in History. And they were all condensed down to five pages. <laughs> so that's where I got my book reports. <laughs> I'm confessing my sins right now. <laughs> but I never read a book. And then God gave me a hunger and a thirst for truth. And you keep doing that, and you're not going to quit learning when you die. You're going to have a whole new heavens, new earth to keep learning things in. So, what would Paul think of you if you were to say, I haven't read a book in years, and the last book I read was a romance novel. Now, there's nothing wrong with romance novels if they're moral romance novels. But that'll be a terrible thing to admit to on Judgment Day. When Jesus <laughs> says to you, what's the last book you read? Uh, Marble Comics. <laughs> when you come bring the cloak, which I left to Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. That's an imprecatory statement, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander the coppersmith, we don't know who he was. There were several Alexanders mentioned in the Bible. It's sort of like the word named Smith or Jones. So there could be as many as five different Alexanders mentioned in the New Testament. This guy was a, a, a coppersmith. He was an artisan, wasn't a scholar. Uh, had creative abilities. And Paul says, this man wasn't a philosopher, wasn't an intellectual, wasn't highly educated. He did me much harm. 
What in the world did he do? Verse 15. Timothy, be on your guard against him yourself. For he vigorously opposed our teaching. And in opposing Paul's teaching, he's opposing the teaching of Christ. This man was an enemy of the truth. This man mocked and exaggerated and ridiculed everything I preached. And of course, people love to hear slander. People love to hear gossip. So he did, he did me much harm in my influence among other people. So you watch out for him yourself, Timothy, because he's vigorous at opposing the Word of God. He doesn't just do it accidentally. He doesn't just do it uh, because he didn't mean to. He vigorously and zealously opposes the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And so Paul says in verse 14, So I'm praying that God would repay him according to his deeds. Now how would God repay somebody who vigorously opposed the truth? Pretty severely, don't you think? <laughs> and so what he's praying, Lord, judge this man, silence him. Cause your wrath, cause him to feel the bite of your wrath. Repay him the way he deserves. Shut his mouth so it no longer be an evil influence in the advance of the truth. That's what you did this morning when you sang those two songs. God loves his truth. And God loves his truth so much that anybody who teaches the opposite can expect to feel his wrath. God will not compromise his truth to save one person from hell. And he doesn't want you to either. And so here Paul is praying this imprecatory psalm against him. But notice his attitude in verse 16. At my first defense, that is his trial in Rome, no one supported me. No one, I didn't have any witnesses on my side. All of my friends, cowards, were chickened out of testifying about me. They all deserted me. What does he say to do to them? May God repay them according to their deeds? Mm -mm. He says, may it, be not, may it not be counted against them. So what made the difference? Paul prayed an imprecatory psalm on Alexander the coppersmith for vigorously opposing the truth, defiantly and self-consciously and deliberately. But when these people deserted him and would not stand up for him in the courtroom in Rome and betrayed him, he said, Lord, don't count it against them. Don't hold them guilty for that. What's the difference? Compassionate man that Paul was, he knew that people can do things out of fear and ignorance. And somebody who does something out of self-consciousness, aware of what he's doing, vigorously opposes the truth, Paul is ready to pray the wrath of God upon him. These people who betrayed Paul as well, refusing to defend him in the courtroom. He says, Lord, don't hold that against him. They were dominated by fear. They were weak people. And in all the goings on today in this country, you make a distinction in the way you treat and talk about and have attitude toward people as they face this crisis and as they face the shutdown by the governments of America. Those that are doing it deliberately, self-consciously, vigorously, like the governor of Michigan, or the mayor of Chicago, or the governor of Virginia, or the governor of New York, or the governor of California, pray God's imprecatory psalms upon them. Amen. 
But when you have these other people that cower in the darkness, that are afraid to touch anybody, go anywhere, go to church, right? all these things, don't just mock them and condemn them as a bunch of sellouts, as a bunch of cowards. They are. But Lord, don't hold it against them because of their fear. But, even though all my friends deserted me, the Lord stood with me, verse 17. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. So Paul, great man of faith that he was, says, Timothy, you know the man I met on the road to Damascus? The Lord Jesus. He was here with me in the dungeon. The Lord stood with me and supported me and strengthened me in order that through me the proclamation or the preached word, the kerygma, the preached word, might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear, all the non-Jewish people in Rome and all over the world might hear the gospel and be saved. And this preached word be accomplished in all its power. Oh, and by the way, Timothy, I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. You think that's a metaphor? Maybe not. Uh, he may say, it, I wasn't fed to the lions like a lot of my Christian friends were. Or, God saved me from that lion Nero. Or God just saved me from the jaws of evil in this world. And not only has he delivered me, but the Lord will deliver me, not from death, but the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and keep me from falling by the wayside before I, I die. And he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. I had to be saved by him. I couldn't save myself. Now I have to be kept by him. I can't keep myself. And I know my life is safely in his hands. Whatever happens to me, God's going to bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greek Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila was a great preacher. And the household of Onesiphorus. Erasmus remained at Corinth. Trophimus, I left sick of Miletus. Make every effort to come and see me before winter. It's going to be hard to travel in winter. It's going to be cold in winter, and I may be dead by winter. Eubulus greets you. Also, Pudens and Linus and Claudia, a woman, and all the brethren. Here <laughs> are the last. God breathed words ever to be written by an apostle. Mm. The Lord be with your spirit, Timothy, and grace be with all of you. You're not going to make it in this world, and the church isn't going to make it in this world unless the Lord is with us and his grace is upon us and we feel the saving power of his grace in our lives. That's it. The last God breathed words is about grace. Let's pray. For the sake of Christ, amen.